Welcome to Abundance. You guessed it, a podcast dedicated to all things surrounding dance. I am Kristen. And I am Hannah. And we are two best friends who are brought together by this art form. Please join us in five, six, seven, eight. Here's a word from our sponsor. Hello, everyone. Welcome today. We have a very special guest with us that we're so excited about. From lead dancer in Michael Jackson's Beat It, Vincent Patterson is known as a director and choreographer in film, theater, concert tours, opera, commercials, and more, creating behind the scenes for some of the largest names. We're so happy that his publicist reached out to us to do this interview. And just a little reminder, always feel free to email us at abundancepodcast5678 at gmail.com. We really love to hear from you and make new connections like we're doing right now. So Patterson's publicist was so generous to get us copies of his memoir, which we've able, been able to start reading and learning more about him. I will have to admit that I am only about halfway through his memoir at the moment, just because life is very busy, but we're excited to have you on today to learn more about you and to continue reading going forward. So welcome, Vincent. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for having me here today. I appreciate it. Yeah, we're so excited. We're so excited to have you and and just learn more about you. You seem like a fantastic person. So as we get going, I guess we just want to know before dance, you found a passion for acting. You actually founded the Bachelor of Arts in Theater Arts and Dramatic Literature at Dickinson College, where you attended school. What did this entail? Can you talk a little bit about your experience there? Yes, well, um, I had I had acted in junior high school and high school and it was kind of, I had a rough family life. So it was a perfect way for me to kind of escape and step into these roles of other characters that were so far from my life, you know, and uh, I worked hard because we were very poor and I thought I really have to get out of this area. It was no culture at all. And I knew I was an artist. I just didn't know what that meant yet. Um, I worked very hard, as I said, and I got into Dickinson College, predominantly on scholarships and a lot of financial aid. And I thought I was going to go to law school, but uh, I stepped into the theater and it changed my mind. And I just knew I had to stay in entertainment somehow. So I stayed at Dickinson for two years, uh, being heavily involved in the theater, having my own theater company, in fact, there. And um, auditioned to NYU because there was no major at Dickinson in theater. And I got in, but didn't get any scholarships. So um, I came back to Dickinson, spoke to David Brubaker, who was the head of the department. And he suggested, why don't I work on putting together an interdisciplinary major, uh, combining theater arts and dramatic literature. And that's what I did. And that's what I was able to graduate with. And many people were able to graduate with and still do so. That's something to be very proud of, to have kind of been the founder, creator of that, and just one of many things that you, you've created over the years. Yeah. Well, it was out of, out of necessity, honestly, you know. I mean, I loved Dickinson, and I, I really didn't want to leave it. I had great friends there, and I had absolute um, uh, opportunity to go in and use the theater whenever I wanted, pretty much. And that was like, you can't ask for more than that. So um, I was very happy that they were open to me doing this and that it worked. Yeah, thanks. And while you grew up learning some social dances from your father, in your book, you stated that you didn't formally begin dancing until 24, which being dancers who are actually 24 at the moment, we know that that is considered in the field a little <laughs> bit of like a later start. So can you share with us when and why you knew you wanted to dance? Well, yeah, my dad, um, he had three jobs and one of them was social dance teacher, not ballroom dance, like we see it on Dancing with the Stars, but you know, when I was a kid, everybody danced. You, you danced everywhere. You danced at backyard barbecues, you know, the jitterbug and a lot of partner dancing stuff. And that's what my dad taught. So 
I loved to do that from the time I was little. And, uh, and I knew all those crazy little dances, just the basic steps and stuff, but it was really fun. But where I grew up, there were no dance studios. Uh, you, you didn't even hear about the idea of becoming a dancer. I don't even think I saw people dancing in anything other than that kind of social dance situation. So um, it wasn't until really that I got to college that I began to see dance a little bit more, even though everything I did in the theater had nothing to do with dance at all. Um, after I got out of school, I worked at Society Hill Playhouse as an actor and then traveled to Arizona because I wanted hot weather. I was sick of the cold. I was sick of the East Coast. You know, I grew up outside of Philly and it was like at those days, it, you know, climate change has made things a little warmer. But at those days, the fun part was that you were locked in for school days, you know, where you couldn't get out because the snow was so high, it couldn't open the front door. But, um, you know, I, I, I just... I didn't know dance was in my future. I really didn't until I took my first dance class at a ballet studio in Tucson. And it was crazy. It was like the endorphins that ran through my body gave me such a excitement and such a high that I was like addicted, like from my first class. It was like, oh my God, I love this feeling. So that's what I did. I stayed in Tucson for several years and studied with everybody that I could. I just got so obsessed with dancing and yeah i was my body was a terrible condition ladies i couldn't touch my knees let alone my toes when i started so i had to break everything apart and build it all back yeah that's as young artists very inspiring to hear because it's kind of just exciting to realize as much as we might think that we kind of have our life planned out for us that you know we might just unlock this other passion at some point in time that there's still that possibility of falling in love with something that we've yet to experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that that's, that's a beautiful way of looking at going through life, Kristen, that, um, you know, you don't get so tied down to everything. I mean, you, you know, you have your focus and you do your work and you do your studies, but you always keep yourself open to what life, life might throw your way. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I absolutely agree as well. You know, I think there's that saying that life happens when you're making other plans, right? Like you, you sometimes just don't know what's going to end up happening and your life goes in a very different direction, but that's what can be really beautiful and exciting as well. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So our next question for you is uh, can you speak on your deconstruction and reconstruction of your body? As you described in your book, a result of not having a body that resembled a dancer or an athlete. So you, you're going off of that. Can you elaborate a little bit more on exactly what you what you mean? I know you said you weren't able to touch your toes right away. You had <laughs> like <laughs> no, I I was in the theater all the time. I was really out of shape. Actually, I ran in um, uh, sophomore year in high school and my junior year in high school I ran but then I was in a bad car accident and I broke my foot in five places so that took my running away and uh and it's been a kind of a difficulty throughout my dancing career as well but um you know when I, when I first started I was like all hunched over and uh like I said I couldn't touch my knees barely to, rather than touch my toes so I did all these crazy things I walked around Tucson with a broomstick under my arms and behind me so it would open up my chest and pull my shoulders back. I had a backpack that I carried around and in it I had um, a big thick telephone book and a like a coke bottle plastic bottle filled with sand and so every time I went anywhere that I could I would sit on the ground and sit on the telephone book to try to give me that gravity to get a better second position because my second position was I don't even know what you would call it it was like straight ahead that was second position for me if I was on the ground two legs pointing forward so I sat on the telephone book to kind of pull my body over and and, and break that part apart and be able to stretch into second and um, I had this coke bottle that I would uh, take my shoes and socks off and just sit there anywhere I was sitting and just roll it under my feet back and forth and back and forth to get some kind of arch. And uh, it was painful. It was very painful at that stage, you know, but it was also fantastic. And to see the progress happen just kept me more inspired and kept me going. 
such innovative ideas or those things that you came up with yourself or where there kind of other people that you were meeting along the way starting out dance that suggested these things to you? No, they just were part of the instinct, I guess. You know, I mean, they say necessity is the mother of invention. It's kind of corny, but it's true. You know, what could I use on a daily basis to just have in my pocket, so to speak, that I could keep myself growing throughout the day, not just when I had a a dance class, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. I know. I'm like inspired to use some of these techniques, Vincent. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure you're in much better shape than I was. (laughs) Hey, but you know, any of our listeners too, if you want to try it out, see if it works for for you too. I mean, (laughs) well, absolutely. I'm telling you that the broomstick under your arms in the back is fantastic because all of us, especially in this day of computers, uh, we just are hunched over our computer all the time. And the whole upper body crunches forward. And, you know, just as an exercise, it's so great just to walk around the house a couple of times or something with that broomstick under your arms and remind yourself that, no, no, no. You know, what did the teachers always say? Necklace to the ceiling, you know, necklace to the ceiling. And yeah, um, show yeah. off your jewels. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> show off the jewels. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, it doesn't hurt. It's always a good thing to do once in a while. Remind your body what it, where it should be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so interesting. So one of my favorite parts thus far in your book was reading all about your experiences working so closely with Michael Jackson. So will you just kind of, without you know going through the whole memoir, we can leave that to the audience to maybe read the full uh full version, but just a little bit uh, about your general experiences, just working in the same room as him, kind of what that was like. It was a little taste of that. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's a big story. It's hard to kind of make a little comment about it. Uh, Michael was um, kind of the, the theme of my career, has been a theme of my career, not only in what I was able to specifically create for him or with him, but so many people, since it was this early time of MTV and, and, and billions of people were waiting for a new music video to come out. It was a crazy time. You ladies don't remember, but it was something that we hadn't experienced before. You know, MTV came out and every week or week and a half, somebody was going to do a new video and you had a party and, and everybody, it was a watch party and everybody came and watched and waited for the next one. Well, when Michael Jackson first came out with Billie Jean, he kind of made a new step in bringing black music to MTV. And this was a huge step. Um, it was exciting. It was his first venture out after being with the Jackson Five for so long. And on the success of just that small success of Billie Jean, he all of a sudden was going to do Beat It. And I auditioned for Beat It and I got in and I became the gang leader in Beat It. And that was my first of working with Michael for over 17 years. And um, it was absolutely inspiring, enthralling. I can't find enough descriptive adjectives to tell you how wonderful the experiences were. Um, In very general terms, Michael was a very kind man, very hard worker. love to be creative in the workplace, love to focus, 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 and then switch with the snap of a finger. And we would laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh and have such a good time. And that's the way I always wanted to work. And that was the way that in working with him, um, I learned about my process. And um, but but dancing with him was a treat. You know, he was this strange creature that on one hand was very shy and timid and quiet. And and then the music would go on and he would turn into just a a, a dancing monster. You know, I mean, like like you couldn't believe. And and especially it was evidenced by watching him in the room with heavily technically trained dancers. And he put everybody to the test. Just when he started to dance, he made you dance better. He just made you dance better. And yeah, and and, and I say this in the book too, and I've, I've said it before, and I don't even know how to describe it, but when you danced next to this man, 
And he started going and becoming Michael Jackson with the music happening and the dancing happening, you would get goosebumps because it felt like, literally felt like sparks shooting off his body and just charging you. The air was charged. I, I don't know how else to describe it. It's never happened before with anybody else or since. Um, it was a remarkable, remarkable experience. Wow, that's so special to have had those life experiences. And you also did get to develop a pretty strong personal relationship as well with him, correct? Well, to a degree, um, as, a, as a director, choreographer, I've always tried to um, keep the personal different than the professional. So I wind up enjoying a professional friendship with people, uh, Michael Jackson, Madonna, Burek, whomever, you know, throughout the years. But um, I, I like to keep a little separation and I'll tell you why. Um, when, when you work with celebrities that are this famous, they are surrounded by yes people. They're surrounded by people who kiss them on the butt and say yes to every single thing they want. And I figured I don't want to be one of those people. I don't want to be seen as one of those people. It's important to me as a professional and in the position I'm in to keep a little bit of distance, you know, so that I'm extremely friendly. I mean, sometimes I'll go out someplace with one of them or uh, have a dinner or go to their house for a party or something like this. But I like maintaining my freedom and I and I like keeping that touch of professional distance. I think they're I think that's one of the reasons of uh, that I have a longevity of working with a lot of artists because I don't try to invade their privacy that much, you know. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I think that's wonderful that you approached your work that way. I mean, I, we have no experience working with celebrities by any means, but I'm sure that that's a challenging territory in and of its own. Yeah, it yeah. can be. No, I, be I bet. I was just going to add on that. It's like you have to probably set some boundaries, it sounds like you're saying. You're saying. Well, I think it's I think it's important for them to set boundaries and for me to set boundaries. You know, um, I just think it keeps the uh, it keeps the professional um, the professional on a level that where they'll they'll continue to listen to me once it gets too personal. And and I would never become such good friends with an artist anyway. It's fine for me to stay back, but um, if you get too personal with with them, then they don't respect and listen to your word as much as if you stay back a little bit keep a little distance remind them that you know they've hired you to do this whatever project it is um that you're going to create something for them but at the same time you're going to attempt to be a mirror to them and reflect what you see on the outside now you know you always have to say that look you're the celebrity you're the one who has to make the final decision but say I create some moves on Madonna and she does them and then we go to shoot and she changes them. And I say, Madonna, I don't understand. You know, this looks so gorgeous in rehearsal. Now you're getting there and you're kind of freestyling and sometimes it doesn't look as good. You know, let's go back to do what we did in rehearsal. So, uh, but I say, it's ultimately your decision. You're the one in front of the camera. You're the one in under the spotlight of the world. I'm just giving you my opinion as a, creator as a director or choreographer and as a mirror to show you what's happening from out here so yeah yeah that mirror element is very interesting because just sometimes I, I find even myself just when I'm dancing you know it feels one way in your body but doesn't always look the same <laughs> it, sometimes it feels great and it doesn't look quite so good but then opposite sometimes you know it doesn't feel good in the body but that's what's what's really uh most flattering on on you yeah yeah and you have to be the one to to tell them that well i think you know they're paying a lot of money and you know i mean they're obviously hiring me or whomever they hire because hopefully they trust them to some degree you know and uh it was always very different with michael and madonna michael trusted 
you just because he asked you to be part of the project and you know he would always tell you if he if something didn't work for him but in a very kind way madonna was much more um speculative and she was always asking questions why do you think we should do that why is that so good what blah 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 this and that and this and that she would always come around in the end but very different very different working uh, attitudes you know both very ultimately positive and extremely hardworking. I mean, you have to be to be a celebrity of that level. You know, you, you can't slack at all, but um, very different working experiences, both positive though. Oh, good. I'm so glad to hear that. And do you still have any kind of relationship with Madonna right now? Do you keep in touch at all? Are you still working with her? No, I'm not working with her. Um, I'm not, uh, I, I haven't been choreographing in a while. I direct is what I do. And so, uh, no, I don't have any projects that would include Madonna at the moment. Um, I've seen her a couple of times. Uh, they, uh, Tooth or Dare showed at the Museum of Modern Art in New York and I was invited to go there. Madonna was in the audience and we sat and talked for a while like that. But no, again, um, unless it's work oriented, I really have no reason to contact any of these people. If they contact me for something, it's another situation. But no, I don't like to invade their privacy. They're, everybody wants something of them. And, and that's the last thing I would ever want them to think that I wanted something. You know, If they want me, that's another story. Right. That makes a lot of a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> absolutely. And can you maybe compare and contrast the differences between working with Michael versus Madonna and just like talk to us a little bit about that? Like, how was it different and similar? Uh, well, similar in that they both are incredibly hard workers. I mean, you can't get to where you can't get to that level of fame without being a hard worker. I mean, it just doesn't happen, you know. Uh, so in the rehearsal space, they both worked incredibly hard. Um, different kind of working techniques, for instance, like Michael liked to dissect the choreography. Um, he liked to take one little section and work on it again and again and again. Um, Madonna liked to look at things in the whole bigger picture and like to start a number from the beginning and go through it, where Michael liked to say, okay, let's just take these eight bars, Vincent, and let me just work on these in the mirror for a while, you know? So very different techniques of how they put it on their bodies. Um, but in terms of following direction and listening and collaboration, no, that was always really good. Um, I didn't have too much um, difficulty with either one in terms of them wanting to, I would go in and you know about dance and choreography. So the choreographer goes in, creates a movement and sometimes alone, sometimes with an assistant. And then we would bring in usually the celebrity next uh, and, and teach them the piece so that if there were alterations that you wanted to make, you made it with them and not the cast. So then they would take a rest and then you'd bring the cast in and teach them everything and then stick them both together and hope it worked. Uh, and usually it didn't. I mean, usually it did. Sometimes mm -hmm. there were little snags, um, just crazy little things. I remember one time with Madonna, I, I, I was doing the Blind Ambition tour and I wanted to do introduce all kinds of styles of dance in that, in that show. Um, some ballet, some modern, some tap, some a, a little ballroom, a little vaudeville, um, a little hip hop everything I could. And I remember there was this one time that I wanted Madonna to be picked up by the guys and, and lifted up in a chairlift, so to speak. And she, and, and she said, no, Vince, I don't want to be lifted up like some girl. And I said, no, Madonna, not like a girl, like a queen. And she said, okay, boys, lift me, lift me. You know, so sometimes, you know, you have to be a diplomat. You have to be a, a, a best friend. You have to play all of those roles to get what you want. It's, a, it's an interesting, interesting position to be in. So. <laughs> yeah. it's so cool to hear about. Wow. And just in terms of all of your, your work you've done choreographing. Can you speak a little bit about the struggle it's been to maybe receive credit where credit was due for your work as this often is an issue faced for, for dancers and choreographers? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I wrote an entire chapter on the, uh, I will say injustices that, are, that choreographers have gone through over the years. Now, things are different 
there's kind of three different sets of choreographers in this country. One are the choreographers that work in the Broadway world. And those choreographers are covered by S, 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 I'm sorry, SSDC, it was called, now it's called the SDC, Society of Directors and Choreographers. And they handle uh, all of the uh, work that choreographers do on Broadway. Then there are company choreographers and they don't really have a union so much. Sometimes they're under the union AGMA, but rarely. And then finally, you have those of us who work on the West Coast predominantly. And those include uh, choreographers in the electronic medium like film, commercials, television, um, documentaries, anything like that, as well as live non-theatrical productions like um, pop tours, uh, fashion shows, uh, things like this. Well, we have no, we have agents now to represent us, but we have no union. So I write an entire chapter about this in the book about why we have to have a union. And recently in the past year, several of us have bonded together and created the CG, the Choreographers Guild. And we're now in, a, in the place of, of um, asking for other choreographers to become members so that we can become a, a strong, um, united vocal uh, force in this industry because we do, we work above the line, which means we are along with directors and producers and um, stunt people and all those people who, who, who have to make, are there to make a movie happen. However, we don't get, we are not guaranteed credit. We have no ownership of our work because we have to sign agreements that are called work for hire, which means we give up all ownership of our work to whomever it is that we're working for. It could be a production company, could be the record company, it could be the artists themselves. Once you do that, they own your work. They own all my babies. I own nothing. Uh, it doesn't matter if you copyright because I can copyright everything I've done by just video now. We don't have to use lab notation, which is the way it was done previously. But even though I can copyright it and say I created this, I don't own it. So I can't legally say put up an evening of my work because I don't own that work. I gave it away. I sold it away without option. I didn't have an option. It was either you sell it to us or you don't work. So what kind of decisions can you make? You know, The things that are important are credit. To me, number one, credit. Choreographers need to be credited along with all the other important uh, uh, designers or, or creatives on a, on a film or electronic project. Um, the second is some kind of ownership of the work so that eventually that might lead to residuals. I mean, you think of something so incredible like Michael Peters creating the dance of Thriller. Now, how many people in the world have attempted to do the dance thriller? It's probably, I mean, it's 40 years old just about now. It's probably the mo most dance piece of choreography that has ever existed in the history of the world, when you think about it. I mean, almost everybody I know has at least done this at one time, whether as a joke or, or not, you know, they lifted their hands in those little claw shapes. I'm doing this so your audience will know what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, side to side, profile to profile. I, it's just absolutely crazy. Michael Peters got one fee for that at the beginning, which is a nominal fee and never saw another penny, never saw another penny. It's just absolutely unfair and shocking. So credit, ownership, Pension, health, and welfare. We have no benefits. We have no 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 health uh, insurance through the choreography that we do, and no future retirement plans are able to be built upon what we do either. So these are things that we're working to rectify. The things that are just unfair and like every. Anybody else on a, on a film set or creating a pop tour, we need to be taken care of as well. So thank you ladies for letting me mouth off on that because I feel very strongly about this. Of course, no, we completely agree with what you're saying and we might not know as much about the all the logistics involved, but it's it's so great to hear that you're kind of out there advocating for other choreographers and hopefully helping to pave, pave a better path for like 
our generation and, and those to come. So yeah, really, we applaud you for, for what you're doing and for voicing your opinion like you are. Thank you. Well, this week, I'm so excited because it's taken me months and months, but I have a, 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 a Zoom meeting set up with um, Bill Kramer, who is the CEO of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, to begin to discuss how more choreographers can become members so that eventually we can have an award for choreography at the Academy Awards. This has been something that's been protested and, and, and asked about for years and years and years. In fact, one of the letters I'm submitting to him is a letter that Jerome Robbins wrote the Board of Governors of the Academy in 1962. 1962, that's 60 years ago and nothing has changed. 60 years ago, how many films have used choreographers in all that time and were still not recognized? It just doesn't make any sense, no sense at all. No, right. and it's it's so unfair, right? Because all of these people have added such beauty to all of these works. And if they're not getting the credit where it's due, that's really upsetting and sad. And so, as Kristen said, like, I don't know, we really applaud you. And I'm so excited that you're able to get the opportunity to do that and speak up on that Zoom meeting. Just how wonderful and so many people I know are going to be so grateful to you for doing that. It's Whether they know it or not, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Patterson is behind all of this, but definitely it will have will have an impact. It sounds like. Yeah, I'm I'm basically doing it with my agent Julie McDonald, who has an agency here, MSA, and uh, the two of us have kind of taken it on our shoulders to see what we can do to to rectify this situation. So. Yeah, hopefully we can make some changes. You know, every small change that's made is another step in the right direction. So absolutely. absolutely. I'm crossing my fingers. Like this is just, <laughs> this is so important. It needs to happen. Thank you, Hannah. Yes, absolutely. And all right. So Vincent, what is some advice that you could give a young person with aspirations to be in the world of entertainment? Um, I think a little bit. Let me see. I I be prepared. And by that, I mean, you never know when opportunity will present itself. You just never know. So if you want to be a dancer, take dance class, get yourself train, have your have, have intense training. If this is really what you want to do, focus, uh, take some acting classes, be as round a performer as you possibly can be. Um, if, if you, uh, I mean, I, I love that there's so much uh, ambiguity, sexual ambiguity in dance these days. You know, women can dance hard and strong and, and men can put on heels and dance, but, you know, be versatile. If, if you're a guy and you can dance great in heels, also be able to dance great in Reeboks, you know? If you're a woman and you can dance great and, 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 and grab that floor in Reeboks, dance in heels too you know you never know what you can do and the more you prepare yourself the more opportunities that you'll have um the second thing is to trust your instincts um that's why i call the book icons and instincts i think it's the little voice inside that if we give ourselves some peace and even meditate a little bit and listen to that little voice inside that might tell you especially when you have decisions to make which might be the right path for you to travel. Um, this is a very important little voice that we have in there and we need to take advantage of it and give it more power than often people do. Um, the third thing I would say is be kind. Um, be a good person, you know, be kind to other people. This is a tough business. It's not easy on those of us who are higher in a higher position than we are, it's just as difficult for them sometimes as it is for those below us. And when you're in that upper position, it's difficult too, because for me, I like to be kind of a father figure and take care of everybody. And there's always difficulty, no matter what you're doing in this business on every single project, whether it's money or egos or whatever it might be. So be kind to those people that you're working with. And finally, be kind to yourself. You know, sometimes we are so hard on ourselves, whether it's because we don't get an audition that we wanted and we blame ourselves and we think maybe we're not good or whatever. Just 
you know, be kind to yourself and, 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 and give yourself a little pat on the back once in a while and a little hug, you know, and say, okay, you're on the right path, you know, keep on going. And it's hard. You're going to hear a thousand no's to everyone. Yes. But if you really want this and if you really love it, stay strong, be prepared, stay trained and do your work and, and, and go after what you want. And I believe it'll happen. I really do in some form or other, you know, it might be that you go down one path and, and you see that eventually that's not the path, but all the energy and, and, and creativity and, and education you've put into that path will certainly pay off because it might just lead you down what you thought was a, the wrong way, but oh my gosh, no, this is what I've been doing my whole life. This is what I'm preparing myself for. Um, so listen to that little voice. It'll help you out a lot. Yeah, that's, that. yeah, we love that. That's such great advice. And I think maybe a lot of people, if they just listened to that inner voice and had the inner maybe strength to keep going, we might have seen a lot more people pursue dance or entertainment professionally. And I think, you know, it's so many people might have missed out because they didn't listen to that little voice. And I think it's just so important to do that and to have that inner confidence in yourself and to be gentle on yourself and just know that you have to kind of trust the process and, and keep going. So I, I yes, that's profound advice. And uh, I thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Yep, yeah, might be profound, but it's practical too. <laughs> yeah. It's easy to do. It's easy to do. You know, it's not easy to do at first sometimes, but if you get into the practice, it it works. It really does. And you know, you wind up stepping away from the nose without your tail between your legs. You know, you can still hold your head up and feel proud and just realize that maybe you weren't right for this project. You know, maybe this wasn't the right one for me. Maybe the next better one is around the corner. And usually it often is, you know, right around the corner. We, we beat ourselves up because we didn't get the, something that we thought was the most important project in our lives. And it doesn't happen. And next the next week we're offered something that winds up being the most important project in our lives you know so stay positive stay optimistic you know stay optimistic yeah one door closes another door opens right absolutely or one door closes and two doors open that's the way i like to look at it you know <laughs> yeah <that's awesome. laughs> so to kind of wrap things up today vincent can you just tell us a little bit about when did you even get the idea for this book how did this all kind of start well um i've traveled and worked so much around the world and most of the times i did it by myself without even taking an assistant with me uh, picking up an assistant that i didn't know in a foreign country and creating a relationship a work relationship that way um, so because of that i would write little diaries, little journals. And it was before social media, before we had computers to, uh, to communicate with our friends and families. So I would write these little daily memoirs. And uh, when I would come back from my trip, I'd put them together and they'd be like 250 page books almost. And I would hand them out to maybe 10 people. And, uh, and that was just a practice that I did. Well, I was directing a play for the woman who co-wrote the book with me, Amy Tofty, I was directing one of her plays and a documentary that had been done on me called The Man Behind the Throne was, was showing at, uh, down at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and Amy went to it and said, you know, after she saw it, you need to write a book. I said, I, I'm not really a writer. Well, have you ever written anything? Well, I wrote these journals before, so let me read them, she said. So she read a couple pieces of the journals and said, you can write, let's do this. And, or, why don't you do it? And I said, well, if we do it together, because you are a writer. So what we did is we took elements from the journals and of course condensed them and rewrote them as well as um, Amy being a journalist as well as a playwright and screenwriter. She did a lot of interviews with me on, on the subjects that I hadn't written a journal about. Some of the things with Michael Jackson, some of the things with Madonna, um, my early life, my education, things like this. And then we used the tone of my um, journals as the tone of the book because I wanted it to feel like 
I'm talking directly to you, you know, and that's been a beautiful thing. So many people have said, oh, my God, I feel like I'm sitting across the table from you as I read this book. And that's because they came from the journals and I was intimately writing to dear friends. So I, we both wanted the book to have that sensibility to it so that it didn't feel pretentious. It didn't feel like a gospel ra uh, rag. It, I, I mean, a gossip, not a gospel, a gossip rag and um Although there is a lot of gospel in what we do, but uh, <laughs> yeah, so that was the reason. It, 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 it's it's just about that, you know, and, and that's how the that's how the book came about. Yeah, and not even knowing you prior to this, Vincent, I will admit that since I'm about halfway through the book, maybe a little more than half at the moment, I kind of felt like I knew a little bit of who you were kind of like what your personality and what you were going to be like before meeting you today over Zoom from, like you said, kind of the tone and the way that the narrative was all written. I definitely sensed a lot of like personality and, and who you are in that. So Oh, thanks, Kristen. Kind of, a, kind of a reverse of like the people who knew you were able to reinforce that it was authentic to yourself, but kind of the reverse, I felt like I got a feel for, for you before meeting you that aligns. Oh. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I would also agree with that statement. I think your book is very personable, if that's the right word. <laughs> and it can, I don't know. Yeah. It's almost like a conversation when you're reading it. And so I hope that other people do get to read it so they can learn more about you and see all the great things that you've accomplished and what, what your life has unfolded to be, because it's really fantastic to read about. And for our listeners, is there a way that they can find your book? Is Can you talk about like maybe an um, uh, online website or a bookstore that they can find your book? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Um, yes, you can get it on Amazon.com. Um, uh, you can get it on Barnes & Noble. I think it's in a lot of other places now. I think it's in like even uh, Target. Uh, I know it's in the drama bookshop in New York. I know it's at Book Soup in Los Angeles, um, but Amazon.com is the easiest. You can also go to Rare Bird Books, which is the publishing company, but Amazon.com is the easiest. And what I would ask is if anybody reads it, I hope people read it. And, and, and if you enjoy it, if you, you could really help out me by going to Amazon.com and even writing a three word review, loved the book. That's it. But, you know, there's this whole thing that happens with the more reviews that come on and then they push your book a little bit more. So any of your readers, if they do have the opportunity to read it, maybe they'll do me a favor and go on to Amazon.com and just write a short little review. That would help me a lot. Yeah, Definitely. yeah that'd be so great. Thanks for, for sharing that again. Credit is due. Like you should you should get the credit and get the, the credit. reward for for all the hard work and and what you've done. Yeah. Um, so everyone check out icons and in instincts if you want to learn more about the incredible vincent and we are just so lucky to have you today so we can't thank you enough for giving us this opportunity and your time for for being on our podcast thank you so uh, much thanks Kristen. thanks hannah i really enjoyed it and i wish you both the best in your careers and your life and and uh i hope you have just I'm just really appreciative for having done this with you. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Thanks for tuning into Abundance. We appreciate your support. We hope to have PK in your interest. Feel free to contact us at Abundance Podcast 5678 at gmail.com and give us feedback on what you'd like to hear. That is Abundance without parentheses. Go dance yourself silly. Bye for now. A special thank you to Richard D. Fiore for our lovely podcast tune and Matt Mellish for our cover art.